So no lie molecular self. Uh, this is uh, for anyone who's local to Philadelphia, a very familiar uh, local landmark, the thinker. And, uh, and so I'm going to try and do a little thinking about this, these classes of data that have a tremendous potential to affect healthcare and a lot of other things about understanding our lives, our possibilities, our propensities for health and disease. The topics I'd like to cover, since we have a pretty highly heterogeneous audience, I was told. In fact, I, it, there was some discussion about whether I should remove the word molecule from my top topic uh, title because uh, it would be intimidating to attendees. So um, if, if the word molecular would be a problem, I think the word informatics would as well. So <laughs> for anyone um, who is uh, new to our field and in the audience, um, I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about what informatics is. Then shift gears to this notion of uh, the grand challenges of uh, molecular biology and bioinformatics that really uh, lend themselves very well to a, a language metaphor, that is biology as literature. We'll shift to the promise of then uh, this coming era of personal genomics, uh, talk about some of the progress that's uh, been made in healthcare institutions, and then some of the looking forward steps. So. But in biomedical informatics uh, is often anchored to this uh, classic article of Ted Shortliff and Bob Greenis that was published in, uh, in JAMA in 1990, relatively recent discipline that addresses the cognitive information processing and communication tasks of, of practice, education, research, including both the information science and technology uh, to support those tasks. Uh, I'm guilty of writing a simpler uh, definition that was uh, in academic medicine in the 90s as the art and science, it's not all science, of organizing knowledge of human health and disease, making it available and useful for problem solving. Uh, and my boss at Vanderbilt, Bill Stead, a uh, well-known figure in the field, uh, probably states it about as simply as it can be that the mission of biomedical informatics is to enable people to use information to improve health. Now, all of that pristine clarity and simplicity be up about our mission um, uh, does not convey the sense of what it's actually like to be practicing uh, this art and science. So I'd like to show you a little movie of, that uh, you may have seen in a different context. If we'll put the lights down here, um, I'll, uh, that it really shows you uh, what it's like uh, to, to actually practice, uh, particularly clinical informatics. This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. So with that in mind, uh, we can put the lights back up, and I'd like to shift gears. But you should keep that frame of mind, because that's about where we are in the uh, attempt to add systems approaches to healthcare. To shift to this uh, growing uh, importance of a grand challenge of 21st century biomedical informatics, and that is decoding this molecular language of living cells. Now. Uh, Unlike Peter, most of you are probably not native molecular biology speakers or molecular genetics speakers. So I'm going to begin with a, a bit of a t tutorial to take you back to your uh, high school uh, biology to uh, review with you the central dogma of, uh, of molecular biology. And it's a very opportune time to do it because it turns out that April of 2013 is both what I would call the 60th year of modern genetics because it is the 60th anniversary. It was April 25th of 1953 that Watson and Crick published their um, landmark article describing the structure of uh, DNA. 
And it turns out, interestingly, uh, that it is also the 10th anniversary of the announcement of the completion of the, the Human Genome Project, which was um, in, in April, on April 14th, 2003. So I think the planets are aligned. Uh, that something about April uh, and these uh, decades uh, of uh, advancement positions this conference well to look uh, towards the future. Uh, this is a, a diagram from the original Watson and Crick uh, article, and it explained for the first time in the history of humanity how um, we could explain inheritance, the very detailed inheritance that had been known since the time of Gregor Mendel about how you acquire traits from your parents, because it explained how we could take a set of uh, linear instructions encoded in this molecule called deoxyribonucleic acid and um, create a perfect copy, two uh, uh, daughter copies of, of a cell, by a process uh, that was based on simple chemical attraction and repulsion between the, the bonds of uh, these, this four-letter alphabet of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, whereby opening up the strands and then uh, creating a milieu where um, matching nucleotides can find their uh, partners, if you will, we can create a near perfect, but not absolutely perfect image. So this is a process that has exquisite specificity, but it does have an error rate. It's about 10 to the minus seventh, so about one out of every 10 million base pairs actually does not align correctly, and so there's extra machinery in the cell to overcome that uh, even small amount of inadequacy because of the importance that all of the letters um, be there both in the proper order and in their completeness. This is a diagram uh, that shows that it, it, isn't, it just starts with DNA. The DNA is, undergoes not only replication but also a process of transcription. That is, it, un, it, it unwinds in ways that we don't yet uh, clearly understand to enable to, to be transcribed into an intermediate messenger uh, RNA molecule that is a image of the DNA and then it moves from the cell to, uh, nucleus to the cytoplasm and becomes the template for the assembly of, uh, of proteins, uh, the kind of pearls on the string that become both the structural and the energy uh, apparatus of, uh, of the cell. So this central dogma of molecular biology um, is uh, based on a language metaphor that uh, is a very kind of simple three letter words. This is a partial set of the translation of what are called triplet codons um, that uh, in essence are the three letters making a word that's in essence this is an alphabet where all words have only three letters and they give rise to a, approximately 20 to 25 building blocks uh, that are the amino acids that go, up to, go together to make uh, the 400,000 proteins that are found in, in the human body. So this language metaphor brings us to some of the challenges and the fundamental underlying biology that affects human health. And so I'll use the language uh, metaphor to uh, show you examples of um, how very subtle changes in the language can have major health changes. So um, a, a point mutation, uh, that is a single nucleotide polymorphism that changes in the, uh, in the DNA, can in our language uh, have uh, a dramatic effect on the meaning of words in an English language sentence. And similarly, we have, uh, as many in this audience will know, a classic anchoring example of point substitution um, mutation in sickle cell anemia, where one letter out of the three billion nucleotides of the, of the DNA um, is changed in the uh, alphabet that gives rise to hemoglobin A, that stuff that makes uh, red cells red and it binds uh, hemo uh, oxygen. And that gives rise to this uh, debilitating disease, sickle cell anemia, when both copies of the gene have that uh, deleterious mutation uh, that uh, characterizes by sludging of uh, red blood cells and swollen, painful digits. That's uh, 
uh, an infant with sickle cell anemia who has dactylitis, uh, the, the dramatic painful swelling uh, caused by the sludging of those cells. And tens of millions of people worldwide are afflicted with that a disease, causes substantial disability, death. Uh, and uh, so an example of the exquisite uh, importance of every letter of the alphabet being right. It's also the case we don't just swap one letter at a time. We have various levels of what are called indels, insertions, and deletions. And uh, they, in a language context, have a very similar effect. So here's a, this sentence that everybody who learned uh, to type, if anybody even ever does learn to type anymore, <laughs> they recognize the, uh, this was the, the sentence that contained every letter of the alphabet. And if you did an insertion of a single letter, by adding a one in uh, to a point. Um, this would be essentially the language metaphor effect in genetics of causing what are called frame shift mutations. You insert one letter and all the, the, the definition of the words downstream of that uh, changes. And you'll notice here that what it has largely done is uh, created um, nonsense, but then lo and behold, actually a new word appeared, dove, that wasn't there before, and that's actually an analog of some diseases where an insertion mutation does cause both nonsense, but actually will cause a new protein to occur, which is an understandable word of the physiologic uh, vocabulary. This is the fundamental problem of bioinformatics uh, these days, and, and that is trying to decode the entire human genome. This is a very famous passage from the literature uh, does anybody recognize it? Well, let me make it a little easier for you since there's no white space there. If I just highlight the embedded sequence that's uh, the important thing, probably a few people in the audience recognize what that is. And, if, and then if I add the white space and the punctuation, now it becomes obvious to you um, that this was a very famous quote, the opening passage uh, from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. So fundamentally, the problem of bioinformatics uh, is that the book of humanity <laughs> has no white space in it, and we don't know where the paragraphs or the sentences begin. And that's not all. It's even worse than that, and that is um, we have a very substantial fraction of our DNA is in non-coding uh, segments called introns, so that in essence, the sentences or, or uh, of the body, and you might think of a, of a protein as a kind of sentence made up of words, uh, they are broken up uh, by intervening sequences inside of the coding sequences. So those have to be excised in the translation. They are taken out. They also become the ways of doing alternative splicing. That is, they're the ways you can actually use the same message to create many different sentences. Um, and uh, they also don't come with their boundaries well defined. So we have a very complex uh, encryption problem to solve. All of our uh, data has been cleverly deposited in our cells uh, in a naturally encrypted form that is the grand challenge of 21st century uh, informatics. Now, that, that said, we've had this vision now for almost uh, 30 years. Uh, the early discussions about the possibility of the Human Genome Project actually occurred uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And this uh, slide actually uh, was from a picture published in the National Geographic in 1987, believe it or not. And it, I think, still portrays our image of the vision of what we might achieve, which is that if we actually understood all those ACs, Ts, and Gs, we would know how one of those things is constructed <laughs> and maintained. And so one can reasonably say, well, all right, so now we're 10 years into this era, we actually have the genome sequence, so what? Well, here's a cartoon from the 90s uh, when we didn't yet have it. And, and so the caption here, if you can't see in the back, says the good news is we have the human genome and the bad news is the computer alphabetized it. <laughs> and so we, have, so we have the genome, but now, so now we have a new caption, same cartoon. But the good news is we have the genome, and the bad news is it's just a parts list. It's not a blueprint yet, because we haven't figured out how the molecular hip bone connects to the thigh bone. And in fact, we actually only know about a third of the parts of the 25,000 uh, genes, uh, roughly, that make up a human being. 
That notwithstanding, we continue to have this health-related promise that we could use those patterns both as biomarkers for health conditions you either have or are susceptible to. So we could do better diagnosis, more precise diagnosis by combining that class of data, not using it standalone, but combining it with the traditional data of healthcare history, physical findings, diagnostic imaging, clinical labs. But we would supplement that in, in our health system uh, with increasingly large amounts of, of molecular data, not just the structural genetics, that's your inheritance from your parents, which I would call genes in residence. About only one or two percent are switched on at any particular point in time by mechanisms we are, that are contained in those intervening sequences and we don't understand that. They're sort of the dimmer switches of the genome and we have no idea really how those are coordinated they give rise when switched on to this class of data called functional genomics. And so that's messenger RNA and other intermediaries. It says that a gene is actively producing a gene product. And then they give rise then to these 400,000 proteins by uh, uh, mechanisms that are completely out of our reach right now um, that represent post-translational modification, other forms of of epigenomics, that is the environmental influences on the genome. So this is the 21st century biology that it is a very early stage. That notwithstanding, we have had more than, than a decade of hype about precision healthcare, particularly in area, uh, focused in areas such as pharmacogenomics, where the rallying cry is the right dose of the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And our ability to also do uh, drug development, that is avoid prescribing drugs likely to cause uh, side effects, reinvestigate, you know, back burner drugs, blockbusters that were taken off the market because one out of a thousand people might get a bad effect, but it was a catastrophically bad thing and we couldn't tell who was going to get it and who wasn't. So we could use perhaps pharmacogenetics now to predict who might get those very rare but very severe effects or even develop entirely new drugs. It's hard to believe it's been 13 years since the New Yorker published this cartoon that said where the patient hands are sequenced to the pharmacist. But I'm going to show you those realities are beginning to occur now in healthcare. It's also the case, um, here's a page uh, within the last year of the announcement of a biotech company. Um, this is one of only about a, uh, probably eight or nine now platforms where you can actually, uh, if you have your credit card, you could actually go buy a personal DNA sequencer uh, now and they will return a full personal human genome sequence in about um, three days of, uh, and they sit on a, on a desktop uh, um, in a clinical chem lab and they're being made uh, CLIA compliant, that sort of thing. So clearly um, that uh, technology phase is moving ahead very dramatically to lower the cost of getting a human sequence and we're also seeing the emergence of what some people in healthcare call recreational genomics. Um, this is uh, 23andMe, so you can, you know, spit in a tube, send it to uh, uh, th this company. They will uh, do increasingly. They don't do your whole genome yet, but that's clearly within reach for them. They do a very highly dense uh, set of markers, uh, between 500,000, 2 million markers, and then um, give you their. Uh, your personal pages that have both your health risks uh, in an evolving science literature with the confidence level and actually a pretty good job of communicating what it means, both the prior prevalence and the elevated risk, the odds ratio, as well as your response to medications. A lot of, of healthcare professionals kind of look down their nose at this, but I, I have to tell you that everyone I know who has had this done has actually found out something at least one or two facts actually highly relevant to their own health care. And so these are mine, and I actually did find some things out. I'm not going to go into detail, but I, I was very pleased to, to, had to, to read that Francis Collins had exactly the same uh, aha moment. He had all three companies, Navigenics, um, and uh, a couple of places that are not working anymore, uh, but uh, in 23andMe, and they all did his genome. They were all slightly different, but he actually found out some stuff that was relevant for his health. Uh, and I thought, if the, you know, if the director of the NIH is <laughs> the genomic medicine, <laughs> the world's expert in the human genome, can find out something that is actually meaningfully relevant about his own health, I think there's something there in this world of, 
of personal genomics. It's clear, however, that big data is coming to an electronic medical record system near you, um, and that part of our ability to interpret this first begins with our ability to, have, to, to be able to incorporate it into our clinical systems and change healthcare so we can move it. Now, what we do know is uh, one thing that isn't going to work is the metaphor of reading and remembering, right? So this is, we know, uh, you know, the classic landmark study from Rand Corporation that it takes 17 years for well-proven events to achieve 50% penetration in clinical practice. That's not going to get it uh, for uh, an era of precision genomic medicine because nobody can read this. Octo Barnett was uh, the one who observed that, you know, if you were diligent and you read two articles every night uh, out of Medline, and this was at a time when Medline was growing, uh, you know, at only 50% the rate it is now, or about a million new articles a year, he, would, he had observed in those days that you'd be about 700 years behind. Now we're 958 years behind. But let's assume that only 1% of the l new literature is relevant to what any healthcare pr provider does. So at the end of one year, you're about nine, 10 years behind. And, you know, I resemble that remark. And I think a lot of you probably have the same sense that it is how in the world can you possibly use this idea that you read and remember in this era of explosive and growing uh, molecular knowledge. Uh, this uh, cartoon, which uh, rose out of a, a Genomics 101 briefing that Bill Stead asked me to do for some electronic medical records executives back in 2007, I think depicts our fundamental uh, problem here. And that is, if you look at the eras of healthcare that go back, um, now I'm a hematologist, so we were pretty molecular back even in the 70s and 80s. But we, um, you know, we are often in a space where we could recognize the determinants of what decision to make by traditional healthcare history, physical, a few laboratory findings. But occasionally we get out of our depth because we get, we had restriction fragment length polymorphisms and for hemoglobinopathies and stuff like that. And so what we're seeing with escalation of adding in the structural genetics, that is the 25,000 genes and resins giving rise to uh, you know, one of uh, 5,000 different uh, discrete levels of expression whenever they're switched on, and they giving rise to two orders of magnitude increase by virtue of 25,000 genes becoming 400,000 proteins, you're somewhere between, um, you know, 10 and uh, intermittently uh, perhaps 1,000 relevant facts on a precise engineering style decision made in healthcare. But we're up against this. Uh, known limitation of human cognitive capacity. Known since the 70s, George Mitchell, Herbert Simon, you know, basically found out that if you're really smart, you can deal with about up to maybe four to seven covariates at a time. Interestingly, that happened to be the number of digits in a phone number, and uh, although we added area codes after that. Um, and, uh, and probably, you know, most of us, as you get further on your career, we're probably down around maybe five covariates and it's and slowly abating. <laughs> um, but it's clear, uh, uh, and this isn't, uh, in this, this ragged uh, time course is not intended to show that somehow we solve the problem then and it, then it comes back, but more that it's kind of a not to scale time course, that you have a person who walks through the door of a clinic with a really simple, straightforward problem and then the next person who walks in has something of extraordinary complexity uh, masked behind a very simple set of symptoms. And that this stutter, this uh, uh, kind of sawtooth complexity, where some things are simple and some are unimaginably complex, is the fact of life of uh, clinical practice in our current era. So let me offer, uh, in the, in, with this as the background for uh, the context of our wanting to incorporate these classes of data for precision of healthcare, a three-step approach um, to managing and using this kind of data for effective personalized care. So step one is we actually got to get the data in the record, right, um, uh, before we can use it. And there we have, we face the problem that the current way that this is mostly done is by the interpretive report generated uh, by a specialty laboratory, the clinical genetics lab or whatever, and sent out. I just love this one because not only was this a document, it was faxed. <laughs> so it was a basic, a lot of knowledge that got turned into black and white dots, 
uh, that could be printed on a piece of paper. It also got put into the, into the uh, electronic medical record as, uh, as an imaged PDF, not even a PDF you could parse. Uh, but you see it has this uh, feature that is common where the actual, the, 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 the sites in the genome that were tested is there, the, the names of the mutations found, and then the narrative interpretation of what that meant, all bundled together in one piece of text uh, in a document format. Well, the problem with doing this is that we are doing, in essence, lossy compression. Now, if you're an informatics person, you understand that lossy compression is, uh, is really good for images, for example, because you don't actually need every pixel in order to get a you know, an reasonably informative um, picture. You can compress it down by losing information. But you can't do that with DNA, because remember the story of the single letter of the alphabet, which, if lost, uh, makes it impossible for us to understand. So this idea that we take reports where we measure a lot of DNA features, then we report on only a few of them, throw the rest away, is uh, fundamentally not adequate for what we want to do. We have this problem of, in, of interpretation being inextricably bound together with the primary observations. The reporting formats are not amenable to even the best of informatics uh, parsing. Every lab does it differently. They all have kind of, you know, Microsoft Word templates, that sort of thing. But more importantly, there are just two fundamental features about this, and that is there's a lot more unknown than known about genomics right now, and the science is changing rapidly. I think we can easily predict that 10 years from now, we're going to look back and not believe how naive we were about interpreting the genome. But even now, we have useful information from it. So this fact that we don't, that we don't know very much about these data that we can acquire now means we're going to need to be able to reinterpret them. Uh, and that um, led us, as a result of an NIH workshop back in 2011, to sort of publish an article on the desiderata for electronic medical record systems. This is no sort of technical recipe, but a set of functional characteristics they need to have. The first is um, that we need to be able to do lossless data compression. So you have this very high volume data, but guess what? You know, we're 99% the same with one another, so that means 99% of the data doesn't really need to be stored. All we really need to do is some kind of diff um, uh, and store the differences, and there are standards uh, for doing that. Um, and so we, want, we need to be able to go from these very large volume high of primary observations to clinical relevant subsets. We also know that these technologies, none of them are perfect. They're all changing rapidly over time. So clearly, the observations need to carry with them the description of the methods, both the, you know, the instrument and the chemistry. Uh, and there are good models for this. Those of you who are data standards people know that LOINC, this standard for reporting laboratory observations, is now more general purpose uh, logical observations model, carries with it a description of which instrument and which methods were used to derive it. That way, if we find that there are blind spots in the data in the future, we, if knowing the method by which it derives, we can still use the good data uh, as we compare it to changes over time in the genome. We also know from the work of uh, uh, Clem McDonald, uh, uh, who coined the term of clinician think speed, that we have to have some compact representation of clinically actionable things that meets the threshold of clinicians in a busy environment. So Clem observed uh, empirically that um, the, the, the think speed was his uh, idea of the amount of time it takes a clinician to get the next idea when they see something on a computer screen. And he actually measured this as about a quarter of a second. And so if you can flip screens faster than a quarter of a second, you'll always be in front of your users, <laughs> right? So it's a pretty high performance uh, uh, functional specification. Um, and you can't do it if you're reasoning across, you know, three billion base pairs. So you need some kind of uh, format of the actionable data that is so small that it can actually be computed on in those kind of uh, ranges of time. We clearly need support both for human viewable formats and for formats interpretable by uh, decision support rules that uh, represent the knowledge encoded in that literature, but in a way that computers can understand it. We're going to have to keep a separation of the primary sequence data, which remains true if accurate over time, from this interpretation of it, which inevitably is going to change with the rapidly changing science. 
And then also, this isn't just a, a six billion base pair problem, right? A lot of people have thought, well, I'll just set aside six gigabytes on the, on the disk, we're fine, right? Because what we already know is that we not only have diseases of somatic mutations, such as cancer, which are characterized by genomic instability. They are constantly changing their genomes. HIV also has this characteristic uh, uh, about it. Um, but also, we're learning that the original dogma that you get a genome from your parents and you keep that uh, for the uh, remainder of your life as this static instruction set also looks like it's not true. We're beginning to see evidence um, from uh, natural aging of healthy people that uh, phenomena such as telomeric shortening, that is chromosomes getting shorter at their ends by losing uh, uh, material, is a clear determinant of uh, health. And so the idea that we're going to have actually multiple observations over time of our genome, just as we have multiple observations of blood sugar or hemoglobin or any of these other features, is going to be a, a necessary uh, requirement for storing this data in electronic medical records. And then lastly, I think there is a, um, a mandate that is an ethical and a moral mandate that derives from the fact that we're discovering that a lot of our important health-related changes are rare variants. That is, things that occur in the genome at the frequency of less than 1 in 10,000, 10 to the minus 4. It is really the case that you and I are snowflakes. We are a unique experiment of nature. No two of us are exactly alike. And so for purposes of being able to do association studies of a set of rare variants, we need potentially be able to pool millions of genomes and associated clinical histories in order to, to be able to say that this set of patterns that occur very uncommonly have an important health outcome. So this says that your electronic medical record and your own, your own personal experiment of nature is actually a unique research resource in a way that we never really thought about individuals as being research resources for discovery of tw in 21st century health science. So those are our seven you know, desiderata, that is functional features of an ideal electronic medical record system um, that would encode uh, and, and store human uh, uh, molecular variation data. This is the picture version of the same thing, right? And that is that um, you have layered classes, not to scale. You have the raw genome data uh, going to a consensus genome that's uh, about a couple of gigabytes. You can, uh, with the uh, ability to um, do this digital subtraction, if we had, uh, and this is the major call of this paper, a clinical standard reference genome, it's really just a string of letters of the alphabet that allow you to just subtract um, from your sequence to get the diff, that is the variations. Um, and if there were published clinical standard reference genomes, that would make it very efficient and compact for us to exchange data between electronic medical record systems, because all we'd have to do is reference the version of the of the uh, you know, dehydration standard we use for, for, com for compressing it. How am I doing on time, by the way? I see, the, uh, I see our, uh, our uh, sponsors are standing up. It always makes me a little uncomfortable that somebody wants me to leave the stage, but I'm going to keep going here <laughs> to say that um, on top of that raw data, there's a, draw, there's a line here where now we add interpretation. So there are the PDF reports, such as the one I show you. And then at the top of the hierarchy are interpretive codes, very compact representation. So here's an example of one I'm going to show you, where you essentially have a keyword sitting in your electronic medical record representing a particular genomic variation that you have that may have health relevance. And the data just sits there waiting for a decision support rule to fire in case a health care provider intends to do something with it. So let me show you an example of once you've got the data in there, how you can use it. You, what you have to do is create both a people and a technology infrastructure to use it for decision support. So here's an example for those of you not familiar with kind of the current state of the art of clinical decision support. It's often done with these pop-ups, usually associated with provider order entry or other kind of teachable moments in healthcare where a provider wants to do something. This was one from Vanderbilt because we discovered that providers were with about a 50% error 
ordering the wrong tests, that is uh, CT imaging in the head when they should have gotten MRI and vice versa. So we created a set of, of, of rules that essentially decision support logic that looked at the, the clinical uh, data, both the natural language and the coded values in the, in the record, and then popped up a screen when a provider wanted to order one of these tests with the recommendation of which one was the preferred. Now they could still override it, but basically by doing that, we were able to both educate them and guide them to best evidence-based practice. Does this work? Sure does. This is a, a, a data also out of uh, Vanderbilt, when, which went live with CPOE in 1994 uh, and had been doing it at scale since the late 90s. Prior to that, um, Vanderbilt, like essentially all academic health centers, and I probably think all health centers, was about a one sigma industry, right? Out of about every 10 chances to make a mistake prescribing, we made a mistake about three times out of 10. And uh, most of those were errors of omission, leaving out uh, data about the, the, the prescription. Some of them were errors of commission, that is drugs clearly contraindicated, rule violations, and a relatively small percentage actually have a, a high risk of causing adverse effects. After the implementation of provider order entry, those numbers of, of, uh, of the classes of errors dropped two orders of magnitude, and they've stayed that way. Stayed that way for almost a decade. And you might say, well, it's just a learning effect. After people get the prompts often enough, then they know to do the right thing. But there have been some experiments in nature where this decision support got turned off, and within 18 hours, it returns to that uh, thing. So it's just a fundamental feature of human beings. They're not very good at list processors. They, um, they're really good at detecting patterns. They're, they're not very good at doing the right thing, only the right thing, and doing it every single time for every single patient. For that, they really need a systems infrastructure. So here's an example of a project we initiated in 2010 back in, in uh, at Vanderbilt called PREDICT, Pharmacogenomic Resource for Enhanced Decisions in Care and Therapy. And it was based on the idea that there was already an FDA uh, uh, black box guidance in prescriptions, in uh, prescribing inserts in, uh, with drugs, uh, guidance that said that you know, genomic testing or genetic testing should be done uh, to enhance the precision with which you prescribe these drugs. And so we adopted a model where we took that guidance uh, as provided by the, uh, by the medical library uh, it went uh, to our, our own local biobank. So Vanderbilt has um, electronic medical record uh, de-identified data associated with uh, 160,000 DNA specimens that can be used to look for whether the, the DNA variant that's described in the literature actually exists in the population seen in that institution. So they would basically see, is it a real problem for the patient seen at this institution? That evidence would then go to a genomic subcommittee of pharmacy and therapeutics that would decide whether it was a sufficient body of evidence to act upon. Now, they, we asked them to use a new standard of evidence. Uh, Dan Roden, my colleague in this work, uh, was fond of saying there's two kinds of medicine. There's mother-in-law medicine and mother medicine. So mother-in-law medicine is randomized controlled trial beyond a reasonable doubt proven evidence, right? But when it's, when you, when it's your mom, like you go a little further to make sure that you haven't, you know, haven't left anything, you know, you'll make sure that you, you go the extra mile. So we asked them to take an even better, uh, an even more immediate view, and that is we asked the members of that committee, if you had the condition of interest and you had the genetic variant, would you use that data for your own health care, especially if it was the choice between one drug and another? So we were not asking them to only look at things that were beyond a reasonable doubt, but was it useful? If they said yes, then it was implemented as a series of uh, two things. One is a, an alert system that basically would look for patients who are, had elevated prior probability they were going to get prescribed one of these drugs within the next five years. So we data mined the EMR to look at the, the profile of patients who are likely to be prescribed one of these drugs. They would get the opportunity, which they could refuse, to have the, the institution do a 200 uh, marker, DNA marker panel of, for drug metabolism, which would then go into their electronic medical record, just the, the drug genome pairs that were, that were basically ready for prime time implementation. And then that would sit there, that data would just sit there until any prescriber, regardless of whether they knew what the word genome meant or not, 
tried to prescribe a drug for which that guidance was relevant. Then the decision support rule would fire, and this is what the face as seen by prescribers of that system would be. And that is, they get a pop-up that, for example, says genetic testing's been performed on this patient and they're at risk, that the drug you're just about to prescribe and the dose you propose to prescribe it is going to be inadequate. This is Plavix and the CYP2C19 star 2 homozygote, for those of you who are in this, uh, familiar with this uh, era. So this era of doing an evidence-based systems approach to guidance allow them to implement this across 1,700 providers, the majority of which had never read the literature that would have supported why they should have been altering the, the, the dosing. But we also put the data in the electronic medical record as seen by providers, and importantly, this is not restricted just to the clinicians. We uh, added this uh, data to the, the, for those who did get genotyping and that had uh, a finding that was relevant for uh, drugs that they uh, might be on, it went in the patient portal. So this is the My Health at Vanderbilt portal, which had um, uh, genomics for patients and families uh, segment to it that had the lay language explanation of what the gene is and what the drug is and why it's important for their health. This is uh, all of that technology eventuated. So we, we went live acquiring the genotype data in September. Uh, in the first week of November of 2010, the, the decision to port rule fired. And of course, there was this little pop-up on all, everybody on the team got an alert that the, the rule had fired. So the whole team marched over. This happened to be the cardiology clinic. And that was the first cardiologist and the first patient <laughs> who got the alert about uh, Plavix. And, uh, and, the, and luckily, the clinician accepted the guidance, and there is a happy ending to that story. All right, so that's the second step. You've got to basically get an implementation. It's both people and process and technology. But if we're going to do this for everybody, you know, we can't all reinvent this wheel. There's too much to know. It's too much inefficiency for every hospital to try and do this. Now we have to have some way to scale this up to a national level so that all providers and all patients and all families can benefit through some kind of public information infrastructure. And for that, I uh, uh, will give you a context for what I'm going to propose. So I've been a pilot since I was 19 years old, and I've it been amazed, uh, and I've flown stuff all the way up to the 737-800, a remarkably, wonderfully complex thing, almost as complicated as a hospital. And that's what I normally fly around. Uh, and, and I've seen uh, aviation transform itself over four decades from a read and remember model. So this is what course guidance looked like in the 20th century, uh, paper published Charts. If you ever watch a pilot walk through a, an airport, you'll see they have this big black case. It's called their JEP case. It's still filled with this paper. And it has essentially all the kind of this direction and that speed and this altitude. And all, you know, so it's a very complicated recipe for arriving, at this case, at Philadelphia International Airport um, in bad weather when you can't see the place. You arrive at the right place at the right time by a safe pathway. Right? So that's what uh, everybody had to read and remember, and then they had to actually move the controls in order to make the airplane fly that route. So this is what course guidance looks like now. And not just for big airplanes, little tiny air airplanes that uh, don't cost very much. And even handheld, you can run this stuff on your smartphone. And that is that the, the guidance for the known safe pathways through the system and knowing how to get there is downloadable. The FAA maintains the the, the, the databases of obstacles and pathways and all the guidance, and, it get, and you download it for a dollar a day subscription, and it goes directly into the, the GPS navigator that's connected to the autopilot, so the airplane knows itself how to get there safely. Now, like a provider, I, I retain full pilot and command responsibility to deviate if that guidance isn't working as planned or something changes the plan, but left to its own devices, the system knows how to achieve the, the, the preferred outcomes. So here's my proposal that we really need and we're just about to be able to do a national healthcare course guidance infrastructure, which is really analogous to this FAA course guidance database. That would be based on several elements, a continuously updated public library of decision support packages that would be an in information commons, a sort of hit Wikipedia for clinical decision support that would be used to feed event monitors in our electronic medical record systems 
and uh, established both these autopilot guidance and guardrails, as, uh, Glenn, Glenn, uh, as Clem McDonald refers to them, that generate system uh, 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 teachable moment alerts, such as the one we saw, and importantly, would it be closed loop decision support. That is, they would track whether the provider accepted the guidance or rejected it. It doesn't really matter, right? Because maybe the providers are smarter than the rules. As long as you capture the downstream outcomes, then you get a learning healthcare system that gets better. And so the rules don't have to be perfect when they start. They just have to be usable, right? And then the system gets better by observing its own performance. Now, if we're going to do that, we have some curly unmet infrastructure needs. We really don't have the knowledge representation standards for what I'm calling a decision support package because it encodes both of this, the recognition logic in the electronic medical record system, the guidance that would be provided, uh, and the recognition logic for the downstream monitoring of either the process or the outcome measure. We don't have a public library of decision support um, that people can contribute to and withdraw from and send back their experience. And uh, there are, in many institutions, a growing number of them, um, author, uh, sort of rule authoring committees that look at the evidence as it applies to your own local population, deciding whether you're going to accept that and then turn that rule on, those set of guidance on, and then watch to see what happens in your own institution. But I think also relevant to this to this conference, clearly consumer-friendly apps that use that same evidence, that same public library, and if it were there, I can tell you within days there would be an amazing set of consumer genomics uh, uh, applications that would use it. And just to prove the point, I just Googled that idea. And um, so the Orange County Register earlier this year, January, had this story about a UC Irvine computer professor who, who had the GenoDroid app uh, running on his cell phone that basically stores DNA segments and can reason with them. So we're, it is just the lack of the availability, I think, of the public library that prevents this amazing creativity that would follow from people like you in this audience to use that data, not only for providers, but patients, for, but for everybody. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll end. And uh, uh, you know, it takes a village to make an idiot. And I need to uh, thank all of my collaborators, both uh, on the uh, uh, technical desiderata paper and uh, the Vanderbilt Predict team. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if we have time, happy to answer any questions.